Wonderful. Good morning. Uh, welcome. Good stuff. You can take your seats. Great to see you this morning. Work my way through the fog <laughs> to see you all. Praise God. Uh, fantastic. Let's, we're going to open our Bibles as we begin this morning. We're going to read two scriptures. The youngest member of our church is called Zechariah, and we're going to read from Zechariah this morning. Uh, so Zechariah chapter 4, it's uh, the penultimate book book of the Old Testament. So if you turn just about the middle of your Bible, you'll find it there, or we're going to read it together on the screen, and then we're going to turn to Acts 2 after that. So let's read together uh, Zechariah 4. We're going to read the whole chapter here um, as it is on the screen. Then the angel who talked with me returned and woke me up like someone awakened from sleep. He asked me, what do you see? I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lamps on it, with seven channels to the lamps. Also, there are two olive trees by it, one to the right of the bowl and the other to its left. I asked the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? He answered, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I replied. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. What are you, almighty mountain, before Zerubbabel? You will become level ground. Then he will bring out the capstone to shouts of God bless it, God bless it. Then the word of the Lord came to me. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands will also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord almighty has sent me to you. Who dares despise the day of small things? Since the seven eyes of the Lord that range throughout the earth will rejoice when they see the chosen capstone in the hand of Zerubbabel. Then I asked the angel, what are these two olive trees on the right and the left of the lampstand? Again, I asked him, what are these two olive branches beside the two gold pipes that pour out golden oil? And I replied, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I, I, so he replied, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I said. So he said, these are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. In the Hebrew there, the two who are anointed is, uh, uh, literally it means the sons of oil. These are the sons of oil who serve the Lord of all the earth. Then we're gonna read together Acts 2. Uh, This is the account of Pentecost, just a few verses. Of course, today is Pentecost Sunday. Remind ourselves what happened on that day. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all gathered in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. You know, as we come to Pentecost Sunday this morning, we have to remember that this isn't a day that we mark in our calendars to remember an event that happened in history. Of course, it is an event that happened in history. We believe that that account was true and what took place on that day. But it isn't something that happened 2,000 years ago that we remember. Pentecost is an experience that we can have every single day of our lives. So we remember that day, uh, but we, we live and can live in the... Re- the reality of Pentecost every single day of our lives. Pentecost was the birthday of the church. It was the day that the church was born. And you don't remember that you're alive once a year on your birthday. You're alive every single day of your life. And the church was born at Pentecost and given Holy Spirit life. And every day is a Pentecost day for the Christian, or it should be for the Christian. The day that the church was given life by the Holy Spirit, and we can experience that every single day. You know, when we go on a journey in our car that's longer than five or 10 minutes, uh, my, li- my wife loves to put on the sat-nav on the car. I don't know whether anyone else is like this when they drive. Most of the time, we know exactly where we're going, but she still loves to put the sat-nav on. It's one of the many arguments that we have inside that tin box of our car. Why do we need the sat-nav on when we already know? But she likes to know where we're headed, how long's 
it going to take? What do the roads look like? The sat-nav will, will highlight the bends in the road. So for those of you that are like her and like to know where we're going, at the end of this morning, uh, the service, we've given time and we've made time and prepared for everybody to have an encounter with the Holy Spirit if you're hungry to. So we're going to be inviting anybody who wants to come to come forward and receive prayer this morning. That's where we're headed because uh, we don't want you leaving saying, wasn't that a good Pentecost Sunday this, this Sunday? We want you leaving saying, how awesome was God in my life today that I experienced something of the touch of the Holy Spirit this morning. So let's pray together. Lord, we thank you as we read in that account, as they gathered those 120 believers confused at your death and uh, trying to understand what the resurrection meant. And they were, they were gathered in that room there, unsure with this calling and commissioning to change the world, just 120 of them. And then you came, Holy Spirit. And we thank you as we read that every single person in that room had a, a personal experience of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't a generic experience for the room, but the fire came and rested on every single one. And we pray this morning, that, Lord, it wouldn't be a generic experience, but there would be a personal experience for every single person in this room of your power and your might and of the Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. A guy called Octavius Winslow, what a name. If anyone's looking for a baby name, Octavius Winslow uh, was born in 1808. His parents had 13 children, and he was the eighth of the 13th, hence his, uh, 13 kids, hence his name, Octavius. And shortly after his parents were married, his mother, a Scottish woman by the name of Mary Forbes, heard the gospel, gave her life to Jesus, and her life was changed forever. And as they were married and they had these 13 kids, um, the father, Octavius' father, um, was a wealthy man. They were able to support this large family that they had, but um, he experienced terrible ill health, spent nearly all of their money on health bills at the time. Then they lost a fortune with one of the many financial collapses that happened in the 19th century, lost all of the money, and they were bereft and poor. They had some links and history in the United States of America, and so they would decided they would take all of their kids and they would emigrate for a better life in America. And Mary Winslow, and uh, by this point there were 10 surviving children, they'd lost three in infancy as, as commonly happened at the time. Um, Mary went ahead with the 10 children. And uh, the father was due to join them, um, but his health declined rapidly and he died before he was able to get across uh, to be with her. In, in, almost in a matter of, of days, the youngest child also died. Her name was Mary, in, uh, uh, the same as the mom's name. Uh, she died. And so Mary Winslow is there in New York having been widowed from her husband and lost her youngest child, absolutely um, broken, left with nine children and not two pennies uh, to rub together. She, well, you know, as you could understand, her life was completely turned upside down, overwhelmed by grief, and this kind of spiritual darkness seemed to envelop her. And so the kids, they, they figured out what they would do to try and help her and help the family. And Octavius, he was seven years old at this point, Octavius with his siblings went out on the streets of New York. They sold matches, they sold newspapers, they tried to find work wherever they could find it to bring in money um, and as this family scraped by daily. But every night, Mary would gather these, the, her kids around her, these nine kids in the rundown accommodation where they lived, in the room where they were staying. She would gather them all together. She would read scriptures to them. She would preach a message to them every single evening, and they would hold a prayer meeting there uh, before they went to bed. In his teen years, Octavius and two of his brothers um, had a powerful encounter with God. All of the seeds that their mother had, had put into their life suddenly came alive, and they began to evangelize to anyone and everyone around them, and they saw people get saved. They would, instead of knocking doors to sell matches and newspapers, they began knocking the doors and saying, do you know about Jesus? Do you know, have you heard the gospel? And Octavius had this rising sense of call uh, to full-time ministry. He felt God set him apart and call him to be in ministry. And so he did that. He began serving in churches. He planted and grew several churches in New York. 
became a renowned preacher in the city uh, and began writing books. By his early 30s, he felt God call him and he moved back to England, his homeland, where he became in the 19th century one of the most famous and renowned preachers. People valued his preaching, would bring him to all parts of the country uh, to come and preach in churches. Uh, His friends, there were three of them, and uh, Octavius Winslow was one. You might have heard of the other two. Charles Spurgeon was his other friend, and and R.C. Ryle, J.C. Ryle was his other friend. Incredible preachers of the 19th century. He was affectionately known at the time as the Pilgrim's Companion because he wrote so many books. And these books weren't academic theological works. They were books that helped people in their Christian walk, how to help people along the challenges of life. As Octavius had come from such challenges, experienced such loss and grief in his life, his heart was to help the ordinary Christian to move forward in Jesus. He was awarded two honorary degrees, an MA, a doctorate, simply because of the the breadth and depth of his prolific writings. In his life, it's estimated uh, that he he wrote over 40, around 40 to 60 books in his lifetime. He even got fed up with the hymn books that were available and wrote his own hymn book for his congregation uh, that uh, compiled uh, uh, 929 hymns that he put together for his own congregation. And you know, Christian history, it's forgotten, largely forgotten Octavius Winslow's story. There's been no biography written about him. There isn't much out there on his life. Many of his books are out of print now, and people are trying to gather them together and put them online, etc. But his story is a remarkable story. And the reason why is because it's an illustration of what God can do when he gets hold of a person. That no matter their background, no matter their insignificance, no matter how unqualified they are, when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of somebody's life, he can do incredible things with them. As we read in there, Zechariah 4 verse 10, who has despised the day of small things? And we could have gone to seven-year-old Octavius Winslow and thought, nothing will ever come from his life, but God took him from peddling matches on the streets to preach into masses all around the world. What an incredible thing that can happen when God gets hold of somebody's life. The same could be said of Israel at the time of Zechariah's prophecy. Zechariah, the book of Zechariah, records the prophecies of the prophet Zechariah. And this nation that has been in captivity for a generation has been released to go back to their own land. But they are not, um, they are not as prosperous and strong as they once were. The land is full of opposition and enemies. Israel, at the time of Zechariah's prophecies, is a broken powerless, small nation. And yet by his spirit, under the leadership of Nehemiah, they rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. By his spirit, under the leadership of Zerubbabel, they rebuilt the temple in the heart of Jerusalem. Because God got a hold and by his spirit empowered a small remnant of people, a small weak people, and they rebuilt the nation of Israel. Who has despised the day of small things? The The same could be said of Acts 2, where those 120 people were gathered together, waiting and praying, wondering what was going on. The Savior, the one, their leader, Jesus, has been taken from them, and he told them it was better that he would go, and they're trying to understand how is it better that our leader has gone as we're gathered in this room with a calling and a commission to go into the ends of the earth and change the world. And look at us, just 120 people hidden away praying. But then the Holy Spirit came. Who has despised the day of small things? And here's the problem is that we as humans, we live and operate so much in the natural world that we forget that there is a supernatural world. We become so consumed with what we can touch and feel that we forget that there is more to the story that is beyond the natural. And Pentecostal living, if nothing else, is a, is a reminder that every day we live and operate not by what just what we can by what we can touch and feel, but by His Spirit. There's a, something going on in the supernatural realm, in the spiritual realm, to everything that we can feel and touch. There's more going on than what we can see in front of us. And this is the promise that comes to Zerubbabel. 
Zerubbabel was a governor, a leader of the Israelite nation. In fact, he, he led the, the um, exit from exile back into their land, into Israel. And uh, Zechariah prophesies to this leader, Zerubbabel, through this chapter. And he says to him, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And this scripture is precious in the life of this church. I think um, Elizabeth was saying it was something like the mid-70s that it was prophesied over our church as it was back then, this very verse. It was painted in in a mural on the wall behind the platform for many years in our old building. And when that was modernized, it was then put on an image that some of you remember to the right of the platform. It was there with a, a picture of the city with this verse written over it, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. It. And, and uh, it has been central to our theology, central to our philosophy of how this church has been built for decades. And it's been demen- de- demonst- demonstrable, demonstrated throughout our history that the church hasn't arrived to this place. Believe me, as somebody who's been deeply involved in this church in the last 11 years, it isn't by our might and it hasn't been by our power and our strategy. This is a work of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. We landed in this building. We landed with the people that we have, all by the Holy Spirit's working. It is to his glory. It's been built by his spirit. But of course, every text has a context. Every verse has a a context around it. And this verse is part of a chapter that we read. And maybe if you were paying attention as we read that chapter, you thought, what on earth is taking place in this scripture reading that he's chosen to read this morning? But it records a vision that Zechariah has. And in this short and prophetic book, Zechariah has eight visions that he records. And this is one of them. And to help us in, in this um, vision, it's sometimes I find it helpful to think of scripture like a diamond ring. Uh, I proposed to Leanne when I was a poor student, and so I bought her diamond ring from an outlet store in a, in a budget in the sales section of an outlet store uh, jewelry. Uh, not just because I'm stingy, but because it's good stewardship to, to operate like that. <laughs> And uh, if you hold her ring, as many of you will do if you have uh, ladies, you have rings with diamonds, you know, you hold it in the light and it looks different depending on the angle that you hold it up to the light with. Fair enough, Leanne's has just a few aspects to it because it is not that multifaceted a diamond because I was on a budget. But some of you have got a lovely diamond on your ring and you hold it up and the the different facets reflect light in different ways. It looks different every time you look at it, and, and it's, it's maybe a helpful picture as we, as we approach Scripture. You know, the Word of God is alive. It's not a static history book. It's living, and uh, depending on what angle you look, you, something is reflected back to you. Yet it's why you can read the same scripture over and over and over again and then you're going through something in your life and you read a scripture and suddenly it comes alive in a different way to you because it's like it's been held up in a different way. And, and this vision that Zechariah has, we could hold up to the light and come at it. We could probably preach a year of Sundays just on this one vision if we were to go into the detail and understanding. And obviously we're not gonna have time uh, to do that this morning. But, but let me just lay out what the picture was. So there should be an image um, of this vision that he has. Uh, Zechariah sees there two olive trees and in the middle of the olive trees is a bowl and there are golden pipes leading from the olive tree and olive oil is coming from the trees into, the go- into this bowl. And then this bowl has seven holes in it and there are or seven spouts and out of each spout, seven, um, seven uh, uh, flows of oil are going down into a lampstand which has seven lights on it and they are alight. This is a vision uh, that Zerubbabel, um, sorry, that Zechariah is seeing and then comes the encouragement and the prophecy to Zerubbabel. And what is clear in this vision and what is so simple to see as you initially read this vision, is the, throughout the vision is the role of oil, of olive oil. A couple of weeks ago at the prayer meeting, we were anointing people with oil, praying for healing. 
and the glass, um, the glass container that we had uh, for the oil was running out of oil. There was hardly any left in it. And as we went back in our groups to pray, we kind of joked with each other, uh-oh, Kings is running out of oil. We're running out of the oil. And suddenly in that moment, the Holy Spirit dropped into my heart. On Pentecost Sunday, you need to speak about oil, oil. Oil is important all the way through the scripture. And of course, there's no power in the oil itself, but it's what the oil symbolizes and represents. Oil throughout scripture represents an encounter with the Holy Spirit, an encounter with the Holy Spirit. And friends, we need fresh oil in our lives. Not yesterday's oil, but fresh oil. And in Zechariah, there is a pitcher of oil constantly flowing, never running out. And these two olive trees, as I said in Hebrew, in the the NIV version, it says these are the anointed ones. But in the Hebrew, it literally means these are the sons of oil. And if you want a title for this morning, it's that, sons of oil. We are children of oil, sons of oil. Oil, And here's how I came across Octavius Winslow to tell his story this morning. I was reading uh, one of the short books that he wrote about the anointing, about oil. And uh, he said this, it will be on the screen, uh, so powerfully and better than I'd be able to say. He said, let us not be satisfied without this renewed anointing. We stand perpetually in need, beloved, of fresh oil. The power we are incessantly exhausting, the grace we are constantly using, the multiform duties, the numerous labors in which we are continually engaging, demand that we keep our eye intently fixed upon the state of our own anointing. We should be fixed on the state of our own anointing. The past application of holy oil will not meet our present demands. We need an overshadowing, ever teaching, ever anointing spirit. We must be anointed with fresh oil. And before we begin unpacking about what oil does, it's important for us to understand how oil was made, olive oil was made in Bible times. See, the oil that we see, if you see oil ever in the Bible, it's always talking about olive oil. And what they would do is they would take the olives with the pits and the skin on the olives and they would crush them in a mill, crush them into a smooth paste under a big stone mill that looks like that. Then they would take the pulp that was left and they would get one of those baskets there and they would push the pulp in the edges around the rim of that basket. They would then get around 10 or 15 of these baskets and they would stack them on top of one another. Should be another image there of them stacked together. Um, And then they would, um, once they were stacked together, they would put it under a press, which is to the right there. The three stones you see are the weights and they would put these baskets under a press and they would increase the weight of the stone. And as the weight was increased and the olives that had been pressed were crushed, oil would flow from the bottom of those baskets into a, into a stone receptacle and then get, go, go into a vessel, into a jar or whatever. And there were three presses of these baskets that took place, three presses of the olives, and each press um, brought out a different quality of oil. And each oil that was brought out of these baskets had a different and unique purpose for it. And it's these three kinds of oil that we're going to look at this morning and how they apply to our lives as we think about oil being representative of the Holy Spirit's touch on our lives. The first one is this, oil bestows the anointing. Oil bestows the anointing. The first press, that the baskets that were pressed uh, down, uh, produced the best, most valuable oil. In fact, this oil is known as golden oil. And as Jewish law and practice determined, first fruits belonged to God. And so the first press that came out would be dedicated and taken to the temple. 
It was with this oil that uh, people were anointed, priests, prophets, kings would be anointed with this oil. This oil would be used for lampstands as we read about in Zechariah's vision. Uh, Lampstands in the temple would be uh, fueled with this kind of oil. They would use it for the preparation of sacrifices, etc. It was used in in the worship, Israel's worship in the temple to anoint things and people. And anointing, anointing means to smear or rub with ointment. See, they would take this oil and they would add herbs and spices to it and make an ointment. And to rub something with this ointment is what's known as anointing. And as objects and as people were anointed, what was happening is they were being set apart for God. They were being set apart as special, consecrated for a specific task. You know, Jesus Christ, Christ wasn't Joseph's last name. It wasn't Jesus' last name inherited by his father. His name was Jesus, but he was called the Christ. And Christ means anointed, set apart, marked out one, smeared with ointment, one who had a unique and and consecrated purpose. He was set apart. Those of you who watched the the coronation just over a year ago now, as whatever you think about the royals and all of that stuff, uh, but there was that incredibly holy moment where they brought the screens around King Charles and no Nobody saw it, and and I think that this has never happened publicly. It's never been televised or witnessed by public. It is an immensely private thing, and the Archbishop of Canterbury took olive oil and anointed the king on his head, on his hands, and on his heart. It was, a, it was a, a moment, I don't know whether you remember that, I remember goose pimples coming all about me thinking, imagine in 2022 in Western secular society, our king is being anointed by a priest. Uh, just an incredible moment. I read this, somebody said uh, this very powerful statement that anointing is God on flesh doing what flesh can't do. That when the oil goes on our flesh, it's a representation of him meeting our flesh and doing what we can't naturally do, but we do by his anointing. Come on, friends, you know it. You can tell the difference between a church service and a church service where there was an anointing. You can tell the difference when you heard a preacher and then you heard a preacher who had the anointing, right? You can tell when a worship leader uh, sings a song, but when a worship leader sings a song with an anointing, there's a difference when the anointing, the anointing takes what's natural and adds God's supernatural to it. It takes what's possible in the flesh and adds what flesh can't do. And you can feel it. Some of you haven't even been Christians that long, but sometimes you're in this place and suddenly you just feel emotional and you get tingles all over you and it's not the good feeling, it's the Holy Spirit. It's because we can feel him in this place. And I'm thankful that for years and years our church hasn't just been about skill and about bringing what flesh can do, but our church has been committed to say, Holy Spirit, we're desperate and reliant on you. We need you, Holy Spirit. And here's the wonderful news. You don't need to be the best, most qualified, most knowledgeable, most skillful, but what you do need is the anointing. And it doesn't matter how clever you are or how poor or rich you are or how how skilled you are, the anointing is available for everybody. In fact, the Holy Spirit came to bring strength to weakness. And so you might feel like the weakest, most uh, pathetic Christian in this room today. Let me tell you, the Holy Spirit is attracted to you today. Because all of us that walked in here and thought we had some might and some power, oh, the Holy Spirit's going, oh, there's no space for me in their life. But those of us who came in this morning saying, God, I feel broken today. I'm not sure if I've got it today. I don't even think the Holy Spirit's for me. It's for somebody else. The Holy Spirit is there saying, I'm here exactly for you. I came to bring power to the powerless, to might to the mightyless. I'm here to bring power and anointing. And I don't mean that it's an excuse for sloppiness. I don't mean that we just say, oh, we just rely on the Holy Spirit and bring nothing. No, we do everything we can do in the flesh, but then we pray and we pray as if it's all reliant on God's anointing um, on our lives. But the problem is that some of us are relying on yesterday's anointing for today's task. And you need fresh oil today. 
You can't live off yesterday's encounter. You can tell us a story of how you experienced God or there was a a revival that happened in a church that you were part of or there was a prayer meeting where you encountered God or you went to a conference and something happened and you're living off of that moment and the Holy Spirit is saying, come on, it's time for a fresh encounter with me today to remember Pentecost but experience Pentecost today in a fresh way. Throughout this vision um, that Zechariah has, he asks the question, in fact, he asked it three times. What is the meaning of the two olive trees? What do they mean? And uh, the angel replies that they represent two anointed people. And this is where if you shine the diamond in different lights, you can get different interpretations and understandings of what that means there. But most commentators agree, as I was studying this, most of them seem to agree that these two people, the most immediate interpretation is these two people are Joshua and Zerubbabel. Joshua and Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel, as we've said, was the leader of the nation. It was his responsibility to oversee the rebuilding of the temple. The thing about Zerubbabel is Zerubbabel was a direct descendant of King David. So he was viewed almost as a prince in the life of the nation. He carried um, royal, he had royal blood and people saw him that way. And the other person is Joshua. And this isn't Joshua that led the people into the, into the promised land as the book of Joshua uh, records that story. This is a Joshua who at the time of Zechariah was the high priest. His name was Joshua. And what the point that is being made in this vision is that there are two olive trees. Why wasn't there just one? There, but there are two because they're representing two groups of people. They're representing kings and representing priests. Kings and priests, people who minister before the Lord, but in the, in the house of the Lord, in the temple, priests, but also people who establish the kingdom and bring the authority of the king into the land. And here's the point of why there were two. Because we make anointing about people that stand before us on platforms, people that minister to us in the house of the Lord. So we say the anointings for the preacher, for the worship leader, for the pastor, for the prophet. But the point that's being made here is that the anointing wasn't just for the priests in the house of the Lord. The anointing was for the king who was bringing the kingdom on the land. And friend, you need the anointing even if you're not in ministry, and all of us are in ministry in some way, you understand the language, but don't excuse yourself just because I'm a teacher or just because I'm a a full-time mom or just because I'm this or just I don't need the anointing. No, you need the anointing in your life. The anointing, there were two trees and it was for everyone. Anointed parents and workers and receptionists and nurses and students. Whatever you do, friend, you are set apart by God. It's not the pastors that are set apart. All of us are set apart. We don't, and, and we don't need people doing good jobs out there as a good witness. No, we need people doing jobs with the anointing, yeah. with God doing something through them that is beyond, beyond their flesh. You know, uh, Joe Kavanagh, the man who shared the gospel with me, he, he, was, a, um, he was a factory um, technician. He worked in a factory that makes copper soups and pot noodles. It was down the road from where we lived. And he maintained machines and fixed machines. And he would tell me over and over again how there would be, be machines that they couldn't fix or part of assembly lines that broke. And he would pray. This is the kind of guy he was. He would pray and prophesy over the machinery and what people had spent days trying to figure out would suddenly start working. Why? Because he knew the anointing of God wasn't just for the house of the Lord, but was for his workplace and for his marketplace. And people would call him, Joe, you need to come and pray for this because we can't figure out what to do with this. That's what it looks like to be anointed in your workplace. And some of you need fresh oil for where you're working and what you're doing. That's how we're gonna change a city. Let me remind you, 1 Peter 2 verse nine, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And the problem is, is that sometimes we outsource that verse to the pastors and leaders in our church. Uh, But the verse is for you. You are chosen. You are a priest. You were chosen by God before you were chosen by somebody on an interview panel. You were appointed. But before you were appointed to where you were, God had an anointing ready for you to go to your appointment. 
And some of you have missed out on that reality. It's all just been what's right in front of you. And today you need to come and say, God, I need your anointing. I need you to help me do what I can't do not just in the house of God for church ministry, but for my workplace, for my business, for my family, for my university, and for my school. The oil bestows an anointing. The second thing that oil does is oil brings the healing. Oil brings the healing. See, once the first press of those baskets had taken place, they would put a block of wood on top of the baskets and they would increase the weight once again. And this oil wasn't as good as the first oil that came out, but it was still good quality oil. And this oil was used for health and healing. It was used for cooking, for food, for perfumes, for cosmetics, and for medicine. And we need the Holy Spirit for spiritual health and vitality. You need the Holy Spirit. Just as oxygen is for your physical life, so the Holy Spirit is for your spiritual life. That we need the Holy Spirit to keep us alive and well. But how many of us know this morning that the devil hates a healthy, thriving Christian? And the devil seeks to squash your life. It's the agenda of his, his um, work is to kill and destroy and to take life away from the Christian. And so the devil comes to attack where there is life and vitality. And the devil puts uh, yokes on us. And we'll come to that in a minute. He puts yokes on us. There's opposition and challenge comes our way. And if you noticed, immediately after Zechariah 4, uh, verse 6, it talked about, that not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. Then immediately after, in verse 7, it says, What are you, O mighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become level ground. As the Lord prophesied through Zechariah, he knew there was a great word of encouragement for Zerubbabel's future, but of course there was going to be opposition in the form of a mountain that would try and stop Zerubbabel doing what he had been commissioned to do. And friend, I wonder if you're facing a mountain today. I wonder if there's something in your way and you know the promises of God, but there's a mountain in your way. A challenge that is there that seems big and intimidating and difficult to overcome. Then I wonder today if we could declare together that verse. What are you, O mighty mountain? Who are you that's standing in our way? See, the anointing means that we're set apart and marked by God. So when the enemy comes in like a flood, we raise up the standard and we say, no, no, I'm marked by God. There's something different on my life. There's a different authority than what flesh can do. See, I can't get up a mountain in my flesh. I'm not gonna be able to get over or do anything about a mountain. But with the touch of God on my life, I can move a mountain by faith. The mountain can move out of my way. And if there's anything this morning in your life that is trying to intimidate you, to make you stop in your tracks, to shrink back, Let me tell you, it doesn't have a right in your life. Why? Because you're set apart by God. You're anointed with oil. The Holy Spirit's on your life. Let me read this to you. Isaiah 10 verse 27. This is in the New King James Version. Somebody's finally happy that I'm reading from King James Version. Says this, it'll come to pass in that day that his burden will be taken away from your shoulders or his yoke will be taken away from your shoulders and his his yoke from your neck and the yoke will be destroyed. Why? Because of the anointing oil. Because of the anointing oil. And a yoke is like a heavy uh, wooden beam that was put on the the head of oxen or or cattle to to drag things. It's It's a weight. And some of you are feeling a weight and it's not a weight of God's glory, it's a weight of heaviness and difficulty and challenge. And there are things and it feels like it's just so much weight on your neck. Let me tell you, the anointing oil breaks the yoke off of our lives. It breaks the yoke of heaviness on our lives. Whatever the enemy is trying to put on you, whatever he's trying to trap you with, weigh you down with, the anointing oil can break it. And we can draw a line and say, devil, you can come at me with a mountain, but the mountain can't do anything to me. Because the devil has power, but he has no authority. 
And when we're anointed by the Holy Spirit, we have the authority, the same has been shared with us this morning uh, through worship, the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead is in us and by his power, we can say, no, no, I'm drawing a line here. I'm gonna draw a line just like in Exodus when the angel of the death came through and they took that blood of the lamb and they put it on their doorpost and the angel of death came to the home and passed over it on that day, on that Passover, the angel of death passed over. We, we can do that when we're anointed with the oil, that the enemy can come at us. We can feel intimidated. We can feel like, can we go move forward? But if we're anointed with oil, then we have the authority and we can draw a line and say, no more, no more. Not only is there a spiritual reality to health, but oil, there's a direct link between oil and physical health, physical well-being. Jesus calls the 12 and he sends them out in pairs in Mark 6 and he says they went out, preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and what they anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. James 5 verse 14, if anyone is sick among you, let them call the elders of the church to pray over them, anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well and the Lord will raise them up. We're gonna believe this morning for physical healing in this church today. There is fresh oil flowing from heaven and we're believing for miracles, signs and wonders. And I'm talking about physical body healings. I'm thankful for miracles and the way that God weaves things together and we constantly see his miraculous hand at work in our lives. But I'm talking about uh, physical healings, medically proven healings. Not just I had a little headache and it went away. I mean dramatic turnarounds in people's physical well-being to believe for healing. And I'm, I'm thankful for the NHS. I'm so thankful for medical professionals, but I long to see miracles in our day. I, I'm not content to sing about miracles or to sing about being a house of miracles. I, I long that we are a house of miracles, that we see miracles because the, the oil breaks the yoke of sickness and disease and brings health and healing. And so if you need physical healing, some of you don't even respond to healing anymore because you've just settled with the pain and the, the um, disease and the diagnosis that you have. And I'm praying that you'll be discontented this morning and say, I'm not living with this anymore. If there's healing available, why would we live with it? Let's believe in faith for physical healing this morning. Time's running out. The last thing, the third thing is this, oil burns the flame, oil burns the flame. See, they would, um, you would think that it was over. They would squeeze every bit of oil in that second press, but then they would take off the wood and they would bring stones and they would put stones on top of these baskets and they would give one last press. You think it would be over, but they press it so hard that some more oil flows out. And this is the least quality oil. It wasn't good, it couldn't be taken to the temple um, and you couldn't use it for health and healing or for food or anything like that. Um, this would, be, would come out and they would use it for lamps, for lamps in homes. It was kind of a waxy texture of oil and they would take that, sell it cheaply and use it um, all over the place. And, and this ultimately was the purpose of the oil in Zechariah's vision. It was so that a lampstand could remain alight. And we understand, you know, Zechariah's vision, um, you know, we understand it was said in the Old Testament before the church was born, this lampstand, they would have thought of it as one of the lampstands that was in the temple and that we could go on all of that. But of course, in the, through New Testament lens, as we hold up the diamond to the New Testament, we understand that the seven lamps of the lampstand represent the church because in Revelation, Jesus talks to seven lampstands, seven churches and addresses them. And the point being made is that we as the church have a responsibility to be a flame, a light for our world world but we need oil to do it we can only shine if we have oil 
In fact, the power of our witness is dependent on the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. What did Jesus say just before Acts 2? In Acts 1, many of you will know it. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. We can't be a witness without the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. And friends, you know, that, that um, parable in Matthew 25 that Jesus t- tells of the 10 virgins and they take their lamps into their tents and five of the virgins run out of oil and five have oil and then the bridegroom comes to claim his bride and five of them beg, beg, five of them have run out of oil and they beg the five that have oil, give us some of your oil so that we can have a lamp ready for the bridegroom but they say, no, no, this is our oil, we don't have any oil. Friends, the whole picture there is of the end times and I don't know what you think about end times but it sure feels like time's running out. Let's not be Christians that are caught without oil in our lamp without knowing the Holy Spirit intimately and personally outworked in our lives. Let's be ready that when the bridegroom comes, Jesus Christ comes to claim his bride, the church, we're ready with fresh oil in our lamps. Let's be ready for that day. Let's not be caught without oil. We need fresh oil for today. And we run dry, just like that Octavius Winslow quote says. You know, we've got so many things that that demand of us, demand things from us. But here's the wonderful news as we see in that vision, there is a limitless supply of oil from heaven. Limitless supply of power and anointing of the Holy Spirit available for us. We run dry, but He never does. There is a limitless supply. And maybe you're feeling burnt out today. Maybe you're running dry. Maybe you're struggling to burn for Him where you are. Then you need fresh oil today, fresh oil. Here's the last thing, the last thing. In Zechariah, there's this sense that not just does oil come from heaven to earth. Because we, we always talk about, or often talk about the Holy Spirit like that. We say, Holy Spirit, come down. Or the Holy Spirit was hovering over. Or the Holy Spirit came into the room. And we, we, we talk about Him like He's up there and He comes down. It's right to think like that. Of course it is. But it's not the full truth. See, there's this sense that um, there's this sense that the Holy Spirit comes on us, but the Holy Spirit also works through us. And if all we've got is the Holy Spirit coming into us, we're like we almost become like the Dead Sea, stagnant, because we need a flow out of us. We need to like the like the Sea of Galilee. You know those two seas in the Holy Land, the Dead Sea. Things flow in, but nothing flows out. The Sea of Galilee, the flow goes in and flows out and it's fresh and alive. And it's like that in our lives. And and Zechariah, as he's asking, he sees a vision that's clear. Oil is coming from heaven down. But then as he's asking, what do these olive trees mean? And then at the end of the vision, there's almost this picture of, of the oil flowing from two people, the sons of oil. It's flowing out of their lives. And God is not looking to just pour on us, but also draw oil out of us draw His anointing out of us, draw things from us. And the only way the oil flows in our lives is when there is a pressing, when there is a crushing. And I know in the life of this church, there are stories. Some of your stories of pressing, and crushing. And it's like there's a weight on us. Per- personal circumstances, your health challenges, grief and loss, some things just bombarding people and we're thinking, Lord, what is going on here? What are you doing? not just in personal lives, but we look around the world around us, the rate of secularization in our nation, the pressures that are coming on a church that wants to preach the gospel and hold true to the gospel. And it feels like things are being pressed and squeezed. But I want you to tell you today, you have to know that God has a purpose in our pressing and in our crushing. The enemy thinks that he's got it, that he's doing it to us, but God is working out something through the pressing and the crushing. God's hand is at work. 
Because the devil thinks, oh, brilliant, I'm getting to these people, I'm pressing them, I'm bombarding them, I'm putting mountains up, I'm going to stop them. But God knows that every time the enemy presses and every time the enemy crushes, it's bringing something out of us, church. Something is coming out of us that's going to be of greater quality than we've ever had before. In these dark end times, as the world presses around us, there'll be an oil that flows from this place and from your life that'll be like nothing we've ever seen before, the working of the Holy Spirit. And just when you, can't, when you think you can't take it anymore, and you would think, God, surely you're done by now. Surely you've got everything out of my life. There's that one more pressing. And what does it do? It brings oil that lights a lamp. And God is pressing you to bring something out of your life that is going to light up a lamp of a testimony to the world around you. That when people look at your life, you're going to tell them the story of what God brought you through. That your test right now becomes your testimony tomorrow. That God needs to bring you to the place where you think, I've got nothing left. I can't take this anymore. So that He can bring out that oil that's going to be a light to the people around you. That people say, how on earth are you still shining bright? And you say, because of the anointing, because of what God has done and drawn out of my life. And the things that were once obstacles become your testimony. Testimony. I was thinking this morning, what about that? Um, what about the, the Red Sea for the Israelites? It was a mountain in front of them as they were escaping Egypt. But then God worked a miracle. God split the Red Sea. And they would tell for generations and generations what was a test was now their testimony. And they would take their kids and show them, we went through those waters. Or they take their kids to Jericho and they would say, look, there were once these massive walls here that seemed so impossible, seemed like everything was over, all of the promises of God done. And then they would take them there and say, but look what God did. Look what God did. Friends, I know in your pressing and your crushing, it is not a good, comfortable process but God is drawing something out of your life this morning and we love our family we love this verse in Genesis 50 verse 20 Joseph says to his brothers you intended to harm me but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And the devil is sending stuff to us because he thinks it's gonna destroy our lives, but he doesn't know that it's gonna be turned around to save many other people's lives as he brings a testimony out of our lives. I wonder if anyone's ready for a fresh oil this morning. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna respond this morning and there'll be an altar call. You can come down and forward and we're ready. We have oil. Remember, there's nothing special about the oil. It's what it represents, an encounter with God. And if you come down, you're saying, yes, please. What we're going to do is the team will come and put just a small smear of oil on your forehead and believe and anoint you this morning. Whatever you're coming forward for, for anointing for your workplace, for being a parent, for a certain ministry, whatever it is that you know you need to respond. But especially if you need physical healing, we're going to anoint you with oil and believe for miracles in this this place this morning. So if you're coming forward, especially for healing, tell the person that's anointing you, this is for healing, so that we know and we can believe with you in faith that you'll be healed. So as many, we'll stay here as long as people want to come forward and we'll keep praying and we'll keep anointing. As the band, the band you, can, you can come up, we're going to play together. They're already here. Some of them are here. <laughs> so should we stand together? Let's just open our hearts. Maybe this is all new for some of you. You're a new Christian or you've not really been around church much, but you know there's something, you just need something more in your life. Come down, this isn't for special people, this is for everybody. Maybe you feel so distant from God, but you wanna reach out to Him and know Him. Come forward, we're gonna pray for you this morning and we're gonna believe for oil to pour from heaven in this place and light lamps for us this morning. So just start coming forward now. Uh, you can keep moving, the band are gonna start playing. And and we're going to start praying and believing for a breakthrough. The anointing breaks the yoke off of our lives this morning. So keep coming forward. Wonderful.